Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Robert Doerr, the president of the American Enterprise Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to today's event, which, along with our colleagues from Brookings, we celebrate the launch of a new volume on, ent on entitlement reform published by the Annals of American Academy of Political Science. A candid evaluation of our nation's safety net seems particularly important now with increasing spending in our entitlement programs and growing partisan divides in our continued fight against poverty. That's why I'm so glad to see the evidence-based proposals that are contained in this volume. It's also why we like, to be, we like being conveners of events like today's. While many of you here may not agree with everything contained in, the vol in this volume, it's important to recognize the inherent value of discussions prompted by these topics. AI stands for a free competition of ideas, and there are a few better forms for achieving that than this one. So I'm particularly glad you're all here, and I'm particularly glad that all of the authors are, uh, and, or the authors that are here representing their chapters in the volume are here because it's a particularly distinguished and important group who work in a field or focus in a field in which I come from, having worked as the Commissioner of Social Services in New York State and New York City. So we have gathered a, an impressive group of individuals working to improve a critical component of federal policy. Their research and their recommendations offer a comprehensive outlook on our social safety net with an eye towards guaranteeing a more prosperous and more secure future. So I'm going to hand things over now to Tom Ketchkemethy. Tom is the Executive Director of the American Academy of Political Science. His efforts were integral in putting this volume together. We wouldn't be here today if not for Tom's work in, in helping us get this done. Please join me in welcoming. I should also say this is now maybe the fourth, maybe, Tom, that you and I have done these things since I came to AI five years ago. I've loved every one of them. I'm going to love today. And, and when I started this project, I was uh, just sort of a, a regular poverty scholar here at AI. And now I'm the president. So here's that's what happens. You work with Tom on an annals volume, and looks what, you can grow up and become the president of AI. Tom, take it over. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks very much, Robert. Thanks to AEI for its partnership in making this happen, and indeed to you and to Angela Rashidi, who wrote for this volume. We'll hear more from Angela about those views in due course. Um, the Institute makes events like this look easy, and they are not. So thank you very much to your staff, Robert, for making all of this happen. The Brookings Institution is also a co-host of this event, so we owe a debt of gratitude to them as well. Um, I want to take one minute to put today's uh, proceedings in context, giving you a very condensed version of how this volume of the Annals came into play. Um, the Annals exists to advance social science in the public sphere and to make the power of social research evidence available to public policymakers and to the general public. The journal publishes every other month, so each volume is topical and will take up a wide range of social concerns and use a volume of the annals to address and illuminate that topic using the best possible evidence. So flashback, if you will, with me in our collective memory to October-ish to 2017, two years ago, when it was becoming more and more clear that the national legislature was going to pass major tax reform. Um, that which would eventually become the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. At that time, the preponderance of evidence and the prevailing opinion among economists was that the tax package, if passed, would uh, lead to extraordinary challenges vis-a-vis -vis the federal be budget deficit, putting even more pressure on Congress to weigh in with plans to reduce expenditure. So it's not a far leap from there to imagine that Congress might want to revisit uh, reform options for some of the country's major social insurance and means-tested transfer programs. Um, and that's what we do in this volume of the annals, imagining that this might be coming down the pike or that that might be coming down the pike two years ago, I called Jim Ziliak. Jim, Jim and I had worked previously on a volume of the annals. I wanted his advice on who might be suitable to edit such a volume, and it just so happened that he and Robert Moffat were doing related work and it wasn't that long into conversation that they agreed to take the lead. And this brings me to another major thank you. Um, this, we needed some money to make sure that we could do this volume as well as it needed to be done and on a very compressed schedule. So Susan Tanaka, who's here with us today, and the Pete Peterson Foundation were generous enough to support some of the effort that went into our authors' conference and into the authors' effort. Um, without 
the Pete Peterson Foundation, this volume in its current form simply wouldn't have taken shape in the way that it did, so a, a big thank you to them. Um, roughly under the aegis of their U.S. 2020 or 2050 program, which looks at demographic, socioeconomic, and fiscal trends that will shape the nation in the decades ahead. So now then, on to today's program. We're going to start with comments from Drs. Moffitt and Ziliak, who will introduce the contents of the volume and offer some general findings and themes that the work has revealed. Um, Robert is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Economics um, at Johns Hopkins, whose decades of work on labor supply and the economic circumstances of low-income Americans has made him one of the nation's foremost analysts of the U.S. welfare system. Uh, Jim Ziliak is a labor economist as well, who holds the Gatton Endowed Chair in Microeconomics at the University of Kentucky, where he also directs the university's Center on Poverty Research. He's published extensively on poverty and been a leader among economist, ec economists in analyses of anti-poverty measures at the individual uh, and community levels. After we hear from Robert and Jim, we will hear from three of the authors who contributed to the volume. First will be Gary Burtless who wrote our chapter on Social Security. Uh, Dr. Bertless is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, and he's working uh, where he's working on the Future of the Middle Class Initiative. He has extensive experience working in and around government. His academic work has been broad with notable contributions in labor market policy, the behavioral effects of taxes and government transfers, the effects of recent attempts at economic stimulus, and apropos of today's session, social insurance. Um, after Gary comes Amitab Chandra, who wrote our chapter on Medicare. Dr. Chandra is a healthcare economist and the Ethel Zimmerman Wiener Professor of Public Policy and Director of the Health Policy Research Center at Harvard's Kennedy School. He's published extensively on cost growth in healthcare, medical malpractice, racial disparities in healthcare, and he's a member of the CBO's panel on health advisors. He's also done a good deal of work on healthcare innovation which probably continue, uh, contributed to a, a really provocative chapter on Medicare that he wrote for us. We'll then hear uh, from Nicole Mastis, who wrote our chapter on Social Security Disability Insurance. Dr. Mastis is an associate professor of healthcare policy at Harvard's Medical School, and she studies uh, how health disability insurance systems affect individual outcomes and behaviors like attachment to work and consumption of medical care. Prior to joining Harvard, she was a senior economist at RAND, where she served as a director of economics, sociology, and statistics, um, the economic sociology and statistics research department, and the director of disability research. Nicole, like all of the authors in this volume, did not shy from the most difficult questions that arise when one takes seriously the task of figuring out the most efficient and effective reforms for what can be very complicated social programs. Anticipating this event, we asked our publisher, Sage Publications, to make the volume free and open for a time. They did, so if you go to ann.sagepub.com, you can browse the work to your heart's delight. We also have about 60 copies of the book here. It's fresh off the presses. I didn't even get my desk, my desk copy yet. And a two-page, plain language, concise summary of the volume. I urge you to take those with you. And with that, um, we'll get started with the panel. So I'd ask Robert and Jim to come to the podium and kick things off. Thanks. Thanks for being here. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, my name is Jim Ziliak. I'm at the University of uh, Kentucky. And I was one of the co-editors, along with uh, Robert Moffitt, on this, uh, on this volume. First of all, I want to begin with some acknowledgments, uh, thanking Tom, uh, along with Jessica Erfer and Emily Babson uh, at the Annals for all their uh, tireless effort to make this possible in a very short period of time. In addition, I'd like to extend my thanks to Susan and Brandon at the Peterson Foundation for their generous financial support to make this uh, volume possible. And then I would also like to thank Robert Dorr, as well as Angela Rashidi for organizing this event. And in, uh, last and not least, I want to thank the authors who were uh, incredibly uh, generous and uh, agreeing to participate uh, in this volume. They were enthusiastic. We asked a lot of them uh, in terms of timeline, and, and we know that uh, there's a lot of time pressure on their very busy schedule. So uh, Robert and I are very grateful for their participation. 
So what's this volume about? Uh, what we do is we bring together leading scholars to assess the options, opportunities, and challenges for reform of uh, 11 of the major programs uh, in the US uh, social safety net. The volume opens with a summary overview by Robert and myself, uh, and then we have the 11 articles, and then that's followed by two reflections, and I'll tell you uh, momentarily about each of those. What's unique about this volume, in part, is that the authors base their assessment on the best available research evidence on the possible effectiveness of these reforms. To my knowledge, there is no such volume like this in the past. Uh, Robert Moffitt has edited two different volumes uh, over the previous years on means-tested transfers for the National Bureau of Economic Research, and one of the marching orders for those articles is that you can't make any uh, policy recommendations. And so what's really distinct about this is we brought many of those contributors to those prior volumes uh, to take that research evidence and assess some of the policy reform options. These policy reforms can either be what's currently in the public uh, uh, sphere, right, under discussion by current uh, policymakers at the federal, state, and local level, or they could be new ideas of their own, what they think should be done actually to improve the program. The intended audience then is for policymakers, researchers, students, and advocates. And uh, I make a, a plug for those attached to universities. Is a, this is a fantastic pedagogical tool. I'm using it currently. I teach an upper division economics class with 40 students at the university. And we're going through each of these chapters. And it's been fantastic uh, material for, for class discussion and, and getting the, the younger generation engaged in these really, really important programs. So uh, first of all, definition. You know, what do we call the safety net? Well, the safety net in the United States is broadly consists of social insurance as well as means-tested transfers. By social insurance, we typically mean uh, these are programs that provide benefits to families or individuals who have a history of significant labor uh, force attachment or have reached old age. Means-tested transfers, on the other hand, are those programs that provide benefits to those with limited incomes or assets and often no explicit work history or explicit tie to, uh, to work uh, or age necessarily. Now in the volume we collectively refer to these as entitlement programs, though many of the programs in the so social safety net are in fact not entitlements, meaning that uh, even though you may qualify for a program uh, some of the programs are actually on fixed budgets, so block grants, and so if the money runs out, you're not necessarily entitled to the benefits. Uh, the, the volume is set up uh, in, the, in the following manner. We first go through the four major articles on social insurance. Gary Burtless first covers Social Security, followed by Amitabh Chandra and his co-author Craig Garthwaite at Northwestern on Medicare, followed then by Nicole Messis at Harvard on SSDI, and then wrapping up the social insurance chapter is Till von Wachter at uh, University of California, Los Angeles on UI. Now, the one major social insurance program that's missing from the volume would be workers' compensation. In terms of expenditures, that's about a $50 billion program. But what sets workers' comp aside from these other for uh, social insurance is that there's minimal federal oversight of the workers' comp program vis-a-vis -vis these other programs, and there's really scant empirical evidence. And we really wanted to have this as an empirical evidence grounded volume as much as possible. So that's kind of a call to the research community to do more work on workers' comp. And then we turn to means-tested transfers. Uh, we have seven articles on means-tested transfers. Janet Curry and, uh, at uh, Princeton and Valentina Duque at University of Sydney cover Medicaid. Then we have Hillary Hoynes at Berkeley talking about the EITC. Uh, next, we have Diane Schanzenbach uh, at Northwestern talking about SNAP. Then we have Mary Daly, who's the current president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, along with Mark Duggan at Stanford talk about SSI. And then the last three are uh, Rob Collinson at Notre Dame, Ingrid uh, Gold Ellen at NYU, and Jens Ludwig at University of Chicago on housing assistance, followed by Ron Haskins and Matt Weidegger, who are both present today on TANF, and then Joe Hutz and Matt Wiswall. Joe is at Duke and Matt's at Wisconsin on childcare policy. Then 
After these uh, 11 amazing articles, we tasked uh, Robert and Angela to read all 11, uh, uh, along with Karen Dynan, and to offer their reflections. So uh, Karen is at Harvard University, uh, Robert and Angela are here at AEI. And so they read each chapter and then reflected on the volume as a whole and offered some additional insights. And so those are very nice contributions and we thank you uh, for your efforts on that. That was a big, a big task. So uh, the next thing that Robert and I do in our introduction is we set the stage for the volume. And what we do is we provide some descriptive trends in spending uh, on these uh, major programs, uh, uh, some background information about eligibility. Each of the individual chapters covers that in more detail, so we don't cover that in great length. And then we follow that up with a, a description of the um, uh, key results from each, each chapter. So these 11 programs currently, well, as of FY 2017, uh, cost the federal government around $2.4 trillion, or a little over 12% of the nation's GDP. Uh, collectively, though, there's tremendous variation in spending trends across these programs. And so I'll take you through briefly uh, the major uh, uh, spending programs. So here I have the four social insurance programs that are covered in the volume. I have Medicare, and then uh, just have the retirement portion of Social Security. We did that because we were pulling out more of the work aspect of it. Uh, Social Security, of course, also has survivor benefits, spousal benefits, and of course, the DI portion is, is uh, part of it as well. So we pulled out the Social Security retirement portion from the SSDI. Um, and so what you see there with the Medicare is trending up. These are an inflation adjusted dollars, $2012. Uh, so we're in real terms, you can see there's massive growth in both Social Security and Medicare over time. And you can see there's a big trend break in the early 2000s. And if this, of course, is with the uh, first uh, cohort of the baby boom generation entering in retirement period. So we have uh, spectacular growth in, in, in inflation-adjusted terms in Social Security and uh, Medicare. If you, by the way, if you add in spousal benefits and survivor benefits, Social Security is still a little bit larger than Medicare, but that's actually going to be overtaken very soon. Uh, next on this graph, we have the Social Security Disability Insurance Program. Uh, and because Medicare and Social Security are so large, right, SSDI looks kind of smallish, right? But it's not small. It got up to about $130 billion in recent years. In the last couple of years, it's started to trend down uh, a little bit, and Nicole will tell us more about that. And then you can see the unemployment insurance program. In a typical year, we're spending about uh, $25 billion on UI, but you can see there is a big run-up. Uh, during the Great Recession and the, and the UI program, and then a run, run down afterwards. Then uh, we have some graphs and discussion on uh, means-tested transfers. Here we break up uh, those that are in kind, meaning they don't provide any direct cash benefits, as opposed to cash or near cash programs. So this graph shows in kind transfers. Uh, the left axis is the inflation-adjusted spending on housing programs, as well as the child care development fund. Uh, CCDF. And on the right axis, we show spending, uh, inflation adjusted spending on the Medicaid program. So, uh, Medicaid, while it's still smaller than Medicare, has actually had faster growth over the last uh, 35 years than, than the Medicare program. So, it's gotten very large and nearly $600 billion in, in uh, 2012 terms. You can see housing is a program that we're spending roughly around $50 billion a year. In a typical year, there was a large run-up during the Great Recession and then a rundown uh, very quickly afterwards. And then the Child Care Development Fund is, uh, in relative terms, a smallish program, about a $10 billion block grant. Okay. And you can see with the uh, CCDF that real spending was, was flat. Now here we have spending on cash and near cash transfers. Uh, the EITC is the line with, uh, with, with the big squares, and you can see that it was a relatively small program after it started in 75, but it was a very quick ramp up in the 1990s. And today, if you follow it all the way up to 2017, uh, it's a larger expenditure than what we have in the SNAP program, our food stamps. Food stamps, of course, had spectacular growth during the 2000s in the program, but it has been declining uh, since the, the Great Recession. Uh, SSI, 
uh, is uh, there showing up at around uh, $55 billion a year. And there you have like strong, uh, steady secular growth since the early 1990s. And that's mostly, uh, remember SSI is for the aged poor, the blind and the disabled. And almost all that growth is from, from the disability component. The additional child tax credit, ACTC, came about as part of the 1997 tax law. And you can see that that program ramped up quite a bit, uh, quite quickly in the uh, first decade of the 2000s, but it's been tapering off the last couple of years. Now, the tax uh, 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 cut that Tom mentioned in 2017 expanded the child tax credit, so we actually expect uh, real spending in that, that program to increase going forward. And then lastly, on that slide, we have the TANF program. That actually stands apart in the sense that spending has either been, uh, in inflation-adjusted terms, constant. This is both federal and state spending, or de slightly declining over time. Okay? And so that, that does stand out, and the overall safety net in the U.S. is the TANF program. So you can see that these pr uh, programs, uh, or these figures, suggest that the financial stakes underlying the need for reform are real, they're substantive, and they differ quite a bit across these different programs. While all of them, except for TANF, are trending upwards in terms of expenditures, uh, they all have uh, different challenges in terms of the, the demographic forces that are uh, driving up spending or changing the mix of spending that's needed in each of these individual programs. And what's uh, really neat about these uh, articles in this volume is that each of the authors kind of tackles that heterogeneity head on and embraces the program for what it is and the evidence that we know about each program and then offers up their suggested reforms. And so now I'm going to turn the podium over to Robert Moffat, who is going to give you a synopsis of the results from the means-tested transfer chapters. Okay, uh, thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, let me say a couple of things uh, 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 before I actually start going through the slides. So um, overlap a little bit with what Tom said. I just want to say that uh, Jim's and my goal here with these chapters was to invite a set of uh, scholars and, and experts on each of these programs and ask them, what do you think? Okay, what do you think we should do to reform these programs? So it's very much their opinions. We said, the sky's the limit here, and if you think that just modest incremental reforms are what we need for this program, defend that. Say why you think we don't need structural reforms. But if you think there should be major structural change, we need a completely different uh, program here, go for that. And you'll find uh, from our discussion today and from reading the volume, we'll find a big mix there. Some people provide actually had structural and incremental reforms. Other people had more of one or the other. All of them uh, began by describing the program and saying what the goals of the program were and then proceeding to what they perceived the problems were and then uh, designing uh, solutions to address what they saw the problems. Uh, there are a lot of different views out there about these issues. Uh, our experts, we asked them to draw on the available evidence and not to go beyond, <laughs> far beyond what they thought they could justify on the basis of the available research and the latest thinking on these things. Uh, but um, uh, there's a lot of uh, room for discussion here. So one of the things I want to say is that, uh, you know, get the book either in hard copy or if, uh, if you're... Uh, under 50 years old, you want, you want it online, I'm sure. Uh, I still have a hard copy here. And uh, the, uh, you'll find the chapters to be very rich. There's a lot in there. And all we can do now, uh, especially for the uh, chapters uh, where the authors aren't here, is just to kind of summarize them. So that's a way of introduction. I also want to say that you'll notice that we have three distinguished authors here uh, to discuss three of the social insurance programs. One author of the social insurance programs could not make it here, uh, Till Van Wachter, uh, discuss the unemployment insurance program. And I don't have a slide, so let me very quickly uh, in uh, 30 seconds here say that uh, uh, Professor Van Wachter uh, proposed some very interesting reforms in the unemployment insurance program, and you should read his chapter if you really want the details there. Uh, there are lots of issues with UI 
uh, the states are, are, are going broke, at least a lot of them have trust funds. If you know anything about the way it's financed, uh, it's financed primarily by state uh, trust funds, although they can borrow from the federal government. Uh, they, uh, they run into serious problems during recessions, but even after the recession's over, a lot of them have a serious problems. A lot of them are cutting back the, either the level or the duration of benefits that they're, they're unemployed or available for. There's a real uh, sense of the uh, uh, crisis in the financing of that program uh, that is probably not very widely known. Read his chapter. He has a lot of proposals for reforming the, the, the financing of that program, uh, also uh, uh, guiding states and how to deal with those problems and whether or not to change the eligibility conditions for unemployment insurance, whether or not to change the duration of benefits, the level of benefits, a lot of issues in there. So please uh, uh, read either online or in, in hard copy his um, volume. So now on the means-tested transfers, uh, uh, I will uh, briefly summarize those and have to say once again, the, the papers are so rich, I feel a little embarrassed uh, at having only one slide and a few bullets for, for each of these. Uh, I'm going to emphasize just what they proposed. As I said, every chapter here had an analysis of the problems. Uh, they also had an analysis of things they did not recommend, <laughs> some proposals that have been made by others that they did not think would be in the best interest of the program. Uh, read them. I'm going to emphasize what they did propose, the positive aspects of what they decided for each program. So the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a federal uh, tax subsidy for uh, working uh, uh, parents. Uh, there are also some state supplemental programs. So here's what Professor Horns recommended. Uh, first of all, the EITC parameters are pretty much uh, it's fixed in nominal terms in the tax code. She had uh, recommended adjusting those uh, for uh, wage growth and inflation. Uh, it's also, if you really look at the, the, uh, the um, benefits that are available to different family sizes, you find a real uh, what uh, Professor Horn thought was really an excessive uh, uh, credit for two family, uh, two children uh, families and three children families. It's kind of a, the way things began. Uh, France has that, by the way, but they have it for fertility purposes. They're trying to encourage people to have more children. Uh, I haven't heard that as a motivation here. Uh, anyway, uh, she thought there were some, some equity changes here to make the EITC credit uh, more uniform and more fair for both um, one-child families and two-child families and also for childless families. Childless families uh, uh, don't get very much from the EITC right now. It's been a, a subject of a lot of congressional attention as well uh, for possibly beefing up uh, childless uh, uh, EITC benefits. There's a big issue with uh, tax filing for the EITC right now, to, uh, paid tax preparers like H&R Block are very prominent in low-income neighborhoods. They charge a substantial fraction of the EITC credit to get uh, to file the reform, uh, f file the tax forms for low-income families. It takes a big hunk out of the um, uh, credit that low-income families get. Uh, there's some free filing right now, but not very much. And uh, Professor Hoynes recommended a, a significant expansion in free filing to allow families to get more of the credit themselves. Uh, and then she discussed another issue. She actually thought that we should think about earned income tax credit expending for non-workers, for example, who are during a period of non-work where they might have been working at other times to carry some of that over. Uh, of non-filers, there are still some people who, who are eligible for that credit, who, but you've got to file your you know, income taxes. If you don't have that tax preparer to help you do it and you're not very uh, uh, well educated, uh, there are a lot of people who don't get it. Uh, and uh, Professor Owens thought we should help them uh, credit. And then there's an old issue here about intra-family, uh, intra-year receipt. Uh, right now, most families get, uh, in fact, almost all families get it uh, during the, uh, uh, in April uh, when they file their uh, taxes. Uh, there used to be a possibility for them to get it spread out through the year. Uh, that's no longer really an option, and it was not very popular when it was available. But um, there are there's a lot, a lot of interest issues. Maybe people would like to talk about that. There's a lot of interest, pros and cons, about uh, getting people uh, to, uh, to receive that credit as they work uh, over the year. So very interesting issue. This, uh, the Supplemental uh, Nutrition Assistance Program that Diane Chansenbach um, uh, studied, uh, she had a number of recommendations. Uh, she thought that 
uh, families run out of their SNAP benefits before the end of the month. If you look at the uh, kind of data, it's kind of been heavily discussed. Uh, families simply use it up before the end of the month, and they and their food consumption drops, and they parents and their children eat less uh, the second half of the month, and um, uh, it's hard to cover the uh, food expenditures. Uh, uh, Professor Shansenbach recommended an, uh, an, um, an incre uh, increase in the level of benefits. It's all tied, we can get into this, the so-called TFP. The benefits in the food stamp program are tied to something called the Thrifty Food Plan, uh, which the um, uh, Department of Agriculture produces for kind of minimal cost of diets, and they use the very lowest one right now. Professor Shansenbach recommended going one run uh, up in that scale. Uh, there's a big issue with summer programs uh, for the child lunch, uh, breakfast and lunch programs. Kids typically don't automatically, they, 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 they go hungrier during the summer because they don't get those, they're not in school. And so when they, in the June and July and August, when they're not in school, they're no longer getting their breakfasts and lunches. And it's a, you have to kind of transit to almost a different program now to become eligible and get those benefits. So uh, she recommended some ways to increase that coverage. The twice a month payments uh, is uh, directed at the uh, issue I just uh, uh, talked about. Lots of discussion in the food stamp program about how to encourage families to buy healthy uh, um, foods uh, and nutritious foods. Uh, and there are some restrictions not on what you can buy, but not very strong ones. She recommended a, a proposal that's been out there for a while for kind of giving extra dollars for uh, certain kinds of healthy fruits and vegetables, which you could implement if you know, if you ever go to the grocery store, they scan everything and there are some codes there that are in the scanner. And so it would be technologically feasible when you scan, you, you buy the item, scan the uh, item, and, uh, and then you swipe your SNAP card, you know, that you get a little bit more if you've bought uh, money, uh, bought foods of this certain type. Um, uh, uh, she has some represent, uh, proposals for work incentives. Right now there's a gross income test. You just get cut off if your earnings go above uh, a certain level. We call that a cliff. You know, you, you, your income goes up and then boom, you just one dollar over and you lose everything. Uh, she recommended uh, raising that and kind of smoothing it out. And then um, uh, she recommended a, a, uh, uh, something to address the problem that during recessions, um, foods, you know, a lot of families really uh, uh, need more assistance. And right now, uh, what has to happen is Congress has to step in and pass special legislation to provide extra benefits during recessions, and they did that in the last recession for the SNAP program. But uh, she recommended uh, an automatic tr trigger, uh, get gear uh, tied to the unemployment rate and the level of the recession. Uh, supplemental security income, uh, uh, Daly and Duggan, a uh, bunch of things here. The SSI program, if you don't know, is really two programs. One provides benefits to the poor elderly, simply by being elderly, uh, and there's another part that provides uh, benefits to the disabled poor, and those are really separate programs with separate problems. Uh, for the elderly portion, they recommended increasing that benefit. The benefit right now is quite below, below the poverty line. She thought it should at least raise people up to the poverty line or get it closer than it is now. Another problem is that uh, in that program, like most welfare programs, there is an asset limit. You can't have more than a certain amount, like $2,000 in the bank uh, or any other kind of liquid assets, for example. Um, uh, most people I know are in favor of asset limits, or at least at some level. Uh, but that uh, asset limit in the SSI program has been held constant in nominal dollars since 1989. And so she recommended, come on, let's just increase this a little bit for inflation. Um, and uh, and then she uh, they also recommended earnings and uh, work incentives through the implicit tax rate. So if you uh, right now in SSI, you um, if you work too much, you again uh, get uh, uh, really above a certain level. It's about a 50% tax rate on your earnings. That is to say, your benefits are reduced by 50 cents for every extra dollar of earnings. She so wanted to reduce that. Um, she also uh, recommended uh, uh, the, on the disability side. Uh, partial disability program. Right now, the SSI program, like DI, which Professor Mastis will talk about, uh, is a uh, so really designed for severe disabilities, unlike a lot of European programs that do provide some assistance to people with partial disabilities. There's also an issue, uh, which will come up, I'm sure, with the SSDI program that 
there's a long waiting period, and during that period she thought um, your skills atrophy, you're not working, you're just waiting around for two years to see if you're going to get accepted or not. Let's do something for those families while they're waiting around to keep them in the labor market, to keep their skills up, and provide them some temporary assistance. Uh, so that's in their paper. Uh, uh, Lots of work programs uh, they discussed. They thought we need more effort to try to design work programs to get uh, SSI recipients to work. And then lots of issues with SSI children, and they proposed tying assistance uh, to, SS, uh, to children in S uh, SSI, uh, uh, tying it to school attendance, and also kind of a little bit paying a little bit more attention to the nature of the disability of the children and another related thing. So uh, I will move on and talk about quickly housing assistance. So here uh, we have a lot of housing assistance programs. Uh, Rob Collinson, Ingrid Ellen, and Jens Lugwood uh, studied that. They're all ex super experts on it. It's kind of interesting proposals. One is um, kind of to address what's widely known is that uh, housing vouchers are limited in value. This is an example of a non entitlement program uh, localities and local uh, housing agencies only provide a certain amount of vouchers. Uh, there's a huge excess demand for those. People get onto waiting lists and uh, they wait years basically until an, an, a, a uh, uh, something opens up. And uh, in my city of Baltimore, they just closed uh, actually uh, yesterday in the Baltimore Sun, they closed the waiting list. No, but they're not going to let anybody get on because it's a 10 year waiting list. And then, you know, be, they say it's just unfair to tell anybody to have any hope that you could get on. So uh, the, the basic question they asked was, look, um, which one do you rather f have? A, a, the subsidy of the, uh, the, of the level we have right now and only serve like 30% of eligibles or serve more eligibles at somewhat lower subsidy rates? Hold, in other words, hold the expenditure fixed, but just spread it out to more people. They pose that as a question, and they think we should move a little bit. They're not saying you know, lower it so much that 100% of people would be uh, recipients, but at least move a little bit in that direction. So. Uh, they were in favor of that. They had an interesting discussion of the, LI, the LITEC, the low-income tax credit, which is a subsidy, tax cr uh, subsidy for developers to build uh, uh, families and uh, build uh, developments, rental units, which will have, uh, have to have a certain uh, fraction of low-income families in there and charge modest rents. Uh, the kind of interesting problem, they thought that's a supply side intervention. That's where you're trying to get more low income and modest rent uh, uh, buildings built, how to get them more built. And they saw that as mainly a problem which is very geographically specific, namely, mainly West Coast and to some extent East Coast. And they said that's where you should put all your LIHTC money. In the Midwest, uh, a lot of people pay a lot of fraction of their income on rent, but it's not for the same reason. The reason you pay so much of your income in rent in San Francisco is there aren't any units, and the prices are sky, right, sky high. In the Midwest, they thought it was because nobody has any income, and the industrial areas uh, have been hurt so bad, and people can't lower their rent that much, so the proportion, it's kind of an interesting argument. I encourage you to read, read that. Um, larger, they have a, uh, 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 Professor Ludwig has spent a lot of time on the so-called MTO, Moving the Opportunity Experiment. We tried to encourage low families, low-income families to move to low-poverty neighborhoods, to neighborhoods where there were children, and they would not be surrounded by high crime, poor schools, and bad environments. And uh, there are some interesting results. The most recent results show that the young children, children who are less than five, if you move them to a better neighborhood, there are long-run uh, uh, favorable impacts on educational attainment and earnings. And so uh, the latest results show some significant impacts for very young children. Uh, the problem is right now you get a voucher and it's for the same amount of rent, whether you locate in a low poverty neighborhood or, or, or in a high poverty neighborhood. And well, the rents are higher in the, in the, in the low poverty, in the nice neighborhoods, right? <laughs> so it doesn't cover very much of your rent. So naturally, everybody, you know, rents in the low income, uh, in the bad neighborhoods, because that's where the rents are cheaper and where the voucher will go for. So they said, how about, you know, tie the rent voucher to, uh, to make it higher if you move into a more high rent area to try to encourage some of those families to do that. Interesting proposal. Um, and there's some other details about altering the rent subsidy formula, some work incentives in there, which I can talk more about. Uh, TANF, uh, uh, we have both the authors here, so 
Uh, they can talk more later, I'm sure, about it. Uh, interesting analysis where they see the problems with TANF are. Uh, their main proposal on work requirements is to kind of gear it more toward an outcome-based system. In other words, how many people do you actually get into employment and do you get them into an upward track uh, of earnings and into a stable where they'll uh, actually have earnings gains afterwards? You should kind of gear these programs and, 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 and rewards and uh, incentives in that system to be on the outcomes, which is unfortunately not the case right now. Um, and uh, they talked a lot about the way in which the target work rate and work, so-called work credits are uh, uh, allowed to states, allowing them to, to actually uh, keep their money and not have any penalties assessed, uh, depending upon how many people they put to work. Um, there's a lot of discussion elsewhere uh, around the country, and including by uh, Haskins and Weidinger on uh, the fact that states today are allowed a lot of freedom in what they can spend their federal block grant on, uh, and um, uh, these authors think we should uh, restrict at least states to spend a minimum amount on what they call core uh, activities, like work, uh, core uh, areas like cash, work uh, assistance, and things like that, and not on other things, which uh, like a, mi a minimum 25% for. Um, uh, wanted to also, kind of in a similar vein, ask states to mo mostly spend their money on families uh, with incomes of below 200% of the poverty line. And that's not the case right now. They don't have to do that. Um, and then there's a no the long discussion of the contingency fund, which is supposed to cover recessions, but it's actually used for a lot of other things. They really said we need to think about TANF more focused on uh, recession area needs and had some proposals for that. And then uh, performance indicators vary widely across states. So, you, you know, some states can... Uh, doing well in others, but they're all using different indicators, so we should use a similar in the perform set of performance indicators that's just across states so we can really see what things work and what things work. Uh, you can't tell what works and what doesn't if everybody's using a different yardstick. So um, it's that. And then finally, uh, well, a couple more child care. Uh, uh, Professor Hudson Wiswall, uh, they talk a lot about how uh, Head Start, and basically, Head Start is also not an entitlement program. Certain number of Head Start centers out there, certain amount of money. If, if, you know, if you want to go in, sorry, you know, if they're all full. So they uh, think really children under five who are in low-income families, given uh, how important Head Start has been shown to be in improving child success, we really should make that an entitlement program. Uh, they uh, had a lot of proposals for uh, child care subsidies, um, and their preferred method is for a tax credit. We already have one called the Child Independent Care Crash Credit. They want to make that more progressive. It's not a refundable credit right now either. They want to make it refundable. It, basically, they're just trying to make it more generous, and that can be used for child care expenses. They have a lot of uh, discussion in there about something I didn't know anything about, which there are quality rating systems out there for child care facilities, and every state is trying to figure out how to measure quality. They put out these rating systems. I don't know. I'm a parent. I never knew about it, <laughs> but maybe you do. And parents are supposed to look at these and kind of judge what uh, child care facilities are good, and it's just a complete mess, and the states, you know, kind of don't know how to measure it. They vary across every state, and uh, uh, Hudson Weswall think this is a, a real potential here for really informing parents. We have an issue here of parents choosing what many people think are pretty low quality child care. Do they know that? Do they not know that? Do they know what the trade-off is between paying more and getting more out of it? You got to give them some information or they don't know. So a uh, very interesting set of proposals. And finally, Medicaid, I'll uh, stop uh, being the last one. Uh, uh, Curry and uh, Duque uh, are very concerned about the long-term care part of Medicaid, which we know is absorbing a huge and increasing fraction of it. They actually think we should move it out of Medicaid and put it into Medicare. Uh, that's uh, what they think, at least, and, and it, they think it would run better that way. Um, they also uh, uh, think there's a real uh, misalignment in the amount of Medicare, uh, Medicaid payments that go to providers versus pri uh, 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 private health insurers, uh, what private payers provide, as well as even different than Medicare. Uh, they have a concern about uh, antitrust regulation providers. Uh, they think there should be more price regulation, and uh, they have a discussion of the health care exchanges from the Affordable Care Act. 
and think those aren't working perfectly, uh, and those kind of interact with Medicaid because you need you you the post health care insurance. You want people to be able to go earn more, get off of Medicaid, and the health care exchanges are supposed to encourage them to do that. Uh, current decay don't think is doing as well as it's doing. So anyway, four lessons here available as it shows uh, programs are all provide, uh, doing something important. If you read the papers, they all say that, uh, they, but they all have challenges, of very, but it's very, talk about heterogeneity, everyone is different. <laughs> uh, they're very complex. Uh, I think you come away from this volume recognizing that there's no silver bullet to solve all these problems. You have to study it, figure out what the goals are, what the problems are, and design specific solutions to the particular problems that each program individually faces. And I, we hope that the chapters will assist in that endeavor. So uh, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. I realized after listening to Robert that I have a lot easier job. I'm just talking about one program. It only has one problem. It doesn't have enough money. And uh, that's, that's a very simple talk to give relative to what Robert just tried to do. Let's begin with two basic facts about the financial uh, status of Social Security. There we go. Uh, fact number one, the program doesn't have enough money. It certainly doesn't have enough money to pay all the pensions that are promised under the current pension formula. Uh, CBO and the Social Security Administration don't agree on the numbers, but they come close enough. Both agree the trust funds that back the benefit promises in the program uh, will run out of money sometime between 2033 and 2035. Fact number two, when the trust funds run out of money, the annual amount that we'll be able to spend on benefits is going to be limited by the current flow of new tax revenues flowing into the program. Number one, from the payroll tax, 12.4 percentage points on the first $133,000 you earn every year. And second, the income tax revenues that are generated by taxing Social Security benefits. Only part of them go to Social Security, the remainder goes to Medicare. At the moment, the Social Security program also receives interest income on, uh, on the trust funds. Now, that's about $85 billion a year on trust funds that currently amount to about $2.9 trillion. And the trust funds are going to shrink over the next decade and a half, and the interest income is going to shrink as a result. As long as the program has a healthy reserve fund, like it has right now, we can continue to pay out more in benefit payments every year than we take in in tax contributions and, and interest income, and the difference is financed by the trust fund, which is going to shrink. CBO and SSA don't agree on the exact cut in benefits that we're going to face when the trust fund runs out. CBO says the benefits will have to be cut about one quarter starting in 2033. Uh, the SSA is a little more optimistic than that. They say, well, it's two years later that it'll run out of money and we'll only have to cut benefits about one-fifth. Okay. The good news is your parents in grandparents are going to continue to collect their Social Security checks. Actually, that comes as news to a lot of people, especially young people who don't realize that when the trust fund is exhausted, we can still afford to pay out benefits. Uh, the bad news, however, is that the checks are going to be one-fifth to one-quarter smaller than they are if the trust fund had plenty of money in it. The odds are pretty good Congress and the President are going to do something about Social Security before the trust fund is exhausted. Uh, at the end of last year, there were 63 million Americans collecting a Social Security check. That number is going to get bigger as more and more baby boomers reach age 62 and start collecting a pension. Uh, nearly all Social Security beneficiaries can vote. I'm told that many of them do so. Not only that, they have relatives, and many of those relatives vote too. 63 million plus a lot of relatives, that's an awful lot of votes in favor of keeping benefits from falling too far. There may be a couple of congresspersons who say payroll and income taxes are already too high. Let benefits be cut 25% when the trust fund is exhausted. Past experience suggests to me, however, that congresspersons willing to say such things in public don't stay in Congress for very long. So I think we can expect there'll be some kind of a solution, some kind of a, uh, a policy 
uh, is adopted to keep benefits flowing, not necessarily at their current level, but it's something approaching their current level. Now let's talk about the program uh, and what, uh, what uh, Congress can do to fix its main problem. Is the program working as intended? Now my focus from now on is solely on the old age and survivors insurance part. Uh, Nicole Mastis is going to talk in a few minutes about the disability insurance program. OSI's main goal is to ensure incomes of retirees and their survivors uh, when, when uh, the breadwinner's earnings cease as a result of retirement after age 62, or if the breadwinner is deceased, either younger than 62 or after 62. Secondarily, most policymakers hope the program is going to reduce old age poverty and boost the relative incomes of the elderly compared with the non-elderly, or at least that's what they hope to achieve in many, many decades after the program was established in 1935. So what are OASI's main problems? I've already mentioned the one big one. The one big one is it has too little revenue or too small a reserve to pay for all of the benefits that are promised under the current benefit formula. What can we do to resolve this problem? Well, the slide mentions the broad policy options. I will describe uh, some specific ones in a minute. How well does the program work? Nearly every social scientist known to me who's looked closely at the data thinks the program has lifted the relative incomes of the elderly compared with the non-elderly, and this is especially true in the lower ranks of the old age income distribution. In other words, the gap is especially big if we look at people who have low incomes past 62 and younger than 62. Uh, some of the most revealing evidence for this comes from the historical statistics on old age income poverty. The, uh, the chart here shows Census Bureau estimates of the poverty rate uh, as, as uh, measured under the official poverty guidelines. The black solid line shows the 1959 to 2017 poverty trend among adults who are 18, uh, 65 and older. The dark blue dotted line shows the trend among 18 to 64 year old adults. Back in the late 50s, more than 35% of the elderly were poor. Uh, by a wide margin, that was the highest poverty rate of any age group in the population back in those days. Early in the 21st century, the old age poverty rate dipped below 10% and it has remained there ever since. Nowadays, working age adults are more likely to be poor by this income standard uh, than, are the pot, than, are, than are adults past the age of 65. Not all the good fortune of the elderly is traceable to fatter Social Security checks. We can discuss in the later on what some of the other things are, but Social Security benefits certainly feature very heavily uh, in the improvements in the money incomes of the elderly poor, elderly low-income population. Here are some uh, estimates uh, uh, compiled by the Census Bureau uh, when they combined income data from a household survey with more reliable income information obtainable in IRS records and in Social Security uh, benefit files. The chart divides the population 65 and older into five income groups ranked from lowest to highest, so the bottom to the top, uh, where, uh, and it shows the percentage of total income that is derived from four sources of money income. First, Social Security. Second, labor income. Third, uh, interest and dividend income. And finally, withdrawals or pensions taken from a workplace retirement plan. Look at the solid blue bars over on the left. These show the percentage of each income group's total income that is derived just from their Social Security benefits. In the bottom one-fifth of elderly families, 73% of money income comes from Social Security. And this is based on pretty reliable data about their money incomes. Uh, in the sec next higher one-fifth of elderly families, 70% of total income is derived from a Social Security check. In the middle one-fifth of families, uh, about half of total income of the elderly is derived from Social Security. Uh, further up, more income comes from uh, workplace retirement plans and more recently from big increases in earnings, earned income. Uh, but in the 
bottom two-fifths of the old age income distribution, Social Security is by a very wide margin the main source of family cash income. Cutting benefits to this group, whether by one quarter or one-fifth when the trust fund is exhausted, would cause sizable and I think unnecessary pain. One reason that Social Security is so helpful to low-income older families is that the basic benefit formula is much more generous per dollar of contribution you make uh, for workers who have low earnings compared with uh, workers who are above average in how much they earn. Here are some SSA estimates of the replacement rates based on analysis of hundreds of thousands of earnings records in the SSA files. Actuaries characterize each record in terms of its lifetime income pattern and what the lifetime total income was uh, in, 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 compared with other people born in the same year. Uh, and then they calculated the basic monthly benefit of five typical workers uh, laid out there uh, relative to the uh, monthly wage that the, the, the person earned during the bulk of their careers. For the lowest earnings, for the lowest earners, the gross replacement rate is nearly 80%. And if you look at those people in the middle, it's about 41%. And if you look at the people who've always been at the maximum taxed amount in terms of earnings their whole careers, it's, it's uh, less than 30%. And that formula understates how progressive the system is because the income tax uh, we apply to Social Security benefits exempts completely Social Security benefits received by lower and lower middle income families and includes up to 85% of the Social Security benefit in those, uh, 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 in the tax returns of, of people who are in the top of the income distribution. So it seems to me the case for preserving the current system, at least for low and middle aged and, and middle average wage workers, is I think overwhelming. The evidence suggests Social Security enjoys broad popular approval, is effective in providing support to the most vulnerable uh, workers and retirees, offers good insurance at a modest cost to low and middle income contributors, and is, and is administered at staggeringly low cost compared with the costs associated with the workplace retirement system. Social Security sh funding shortfall isn't the result of the fact that we taxed today's older workers too little over the course of their careers. Rather, it's the result of the fact that the system was quite generous and how high the benefits were to early generations of contributors who contributed a little and got uh, sizable benefits in comparison. Now, the Social Security trustees evaluate the long-term outlook over a 75-year period, and we can think of each potential reform as closing a certain proportion of that long-term gap in financing for Social Security. Congress could increase the payroll tax on the current wage base by 2.8 percentage points, boosting the combined tax rate from 12.4% to 15.2% for those of us who pay Social Security contributions. This eliminates the entire 75-year funding shortfall. It could eliminate the cap on taxable earnings, as some presidential candidates have proposed, and give workers credit for their extra contributions in determining what benefit they're eventually going to receive. That isn't always part of the most liberal uh, proponent's uh, suggestion. Uh, but that proposal would eliminate two-thirds of the 75-year funding shortfall. Alternatively, it could give workers no credit whatever for the extra contributions they make above the current tax max. And that would eliminate 83% uh, of the funding shortfall. Uh, my own proposal, my own, what I favor is improving the minimum benefit we allow to long service, low wage workers so they can continue to receive their current Social Security benefits that they're eligible for at age 62, but for everyone else, raise the uh, full retirement age gradually in line with improvements in longevity after age 20. Uh, I think we should raise the, uh, the maximum earnings that are subject to the Social Security tax so that 90% of total earnings 
in the Social Security covered sector are, are taxed by the Social Security payroll tax. And I think the residual of the of the shortfall should be handled by gr gradually raising the payroll tax rate. Uh, that combination of benefit cuts, which would be very unpopular, I think, among voters, at least what they tell us, and, uh, and increases in the tax revenues available to the system is probably the best thing we can do in the short run. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my co-author, Craig Garthwick from Northwestern, is not here, but uh, he's responsible for all the problems um, in our proposal. Um, so it is a little awkward to stand before you and talk about uh, economic principles for Medicare reform when I feel like every time I turn on the television, the conversation is about how not to use economic principles for Medicare reform. Um, but that said, um, you know, it was fun for us to work on this paper. And let me just kind of tell you how, how we see the challenge ahead of us. Medicare is a great program. Um, it's been around for a very long time. The last time it was really revamped was in 2006. So we have an opportunity ahead of us. Um, it does offer universal coverage. It has had relatively slow spending growth, and it is extremely popular. But pushing in the other direction is that despite studying this program for over 20 years, you know, I only know parts of it, and you sort of have to be at MedPAC for most of your life to understand the full Gordian administrative structure of this program. The fact that it often relies on whack-a-mole kind of approaches to payment, so it'll do something and it won't really work, and so then we'll kind of change the dials in a particular direction with the hope that things start to work. Um, it has an incredible appetite for pay for performance programs, almost all of which never seem to work. And so rather than sort of doing the thing that economists would want to do, which is, gee, let's try to create a program where we get the prices right, I think the approach is always, well, we don't need to get the prices right. We just need to do kind of pay for performance. But pay for performance is really about getting the prices right for performance, but we're not very good at measuring performance. Um, and then I think it has uh, two other challenges which we'll talk about. The first is it has a uniform benefit structure. And on the one hand, this sounds extremely attractive. On the other hand, in a country with incredible and with growing income inequality, it really doesn't make sense to assume that Americans who have very different incomes actually want to be in a program with a uniform benefit structure. Some Americans may actually be willing to spend a fair bit of money for more generous coverage. And we've certainly seen this in other European systems. And finally, despite having uniform uh, universal benefit structure, there's many situations where the program has overinsurance and underinsurance. So let me just put two slides up from the Peterson uh, Foundation, which is, um, you know, I think they sort of highlight from a financing point of view two challenges that Craig and I are very interested in. First is the relatively small share of the program that is financed by premiums and how that, you know, that's in green. So it's about 15% of the program is financed by Medicare premiums. Um, and then a smaller share over time is being paid for by payroll taxes, which means that over time we're relying on general revenues more and more to pay for the program, which is fine if we don't have other priorities, but it's not fine if we think that some of those monies may be better spent on education, on SNAP, on Medicaid, on just all of the other programs in this book. Um, and then I think another slide uh, to kind of highlight the challenge is this challenge of overinsurance and underinsurance. Medicare, because it's unable to use any kind of cost effectiveness analysis, does a pretty good job of covering a remarkable set of dubious medical technologies that no country in the world would cover. In that sense, we're overinsured, but we're also underinsured. If you're a Medicare beneficiary and you're in Medicare Part D and, and, and you're above the catastrophic cap, well, you're still spending, you know, you have to spend 5%, uh, you pick up 5% of the cost of prescription drug coverage. And as you can see, for some Americans, that's going to be close to about $10,000 a year. This was in 2015. This is not dealt with with what we've done with kind of closing the donut hole in um, uh, recently. So as in an era of gene therapies, in an era of transformational Alzheimer's drugs, 
elderly Medicare beneficiaries who are getting Social Security checks are on the hook for um, this kind of incredibly high out-of-pocket payments, and that's the underinsurance that exists in the program. So in terms of the challenges before us, there's the fiscal challenge. There's the fact that Medicare often responds to the fiscal challenge through a set of ad hoc plan designs and you know, kind of relying on regulated pricing. But it also, at the same time, doesn't do the thing that everybody else would tell it to do, which is, gee, just use cost-effectiveness analysis. Maybe don't cover every hospital in America. Maybe try to use narrow networks. All of those things are prohibited in traditional Medicare, but they are allowed in Medicare Advantage, which is one reason that we're going to emphasize Medicare Advantage as a path to thinking about Medicare reform. And then finally, uh, for those of you who live in Washington, you, you know that this is a program that has tremendous scope for capture and lobbying because of the ability of, of associations to go to Congress and say, you know, trust us, we need to be paid more because if we're not paid more, we'll grow out of business. Congress has incredible appetite uh, to listen to those kinds of arguments. So I think we want to rely less on that part of, of Medicare. Um, there is, however, when you t think about the, uh, the regulated pricing, a growing scope for monopsonistic pricing as Medicare becomes a larger and larger payer. So if you th this is an important challenge if we're thinking about Medicare for all proposals. You know, it's one thing for Medicare to know the prices or come up with administrative prices when you have a commercial market to index yourself to, to compare yourself to. But if the commercial market goes away completely, now the challenge of knowing what the right price is is extremely difficult. And the appetite for a single payer to set too low of a price will be quite high in our book. And everyone might say, well, that's awesome because you would have reduced spending growth. Yes, we would have reduced spending growth, but we would have also reduced innovation in healthcare, which we think is desperately needed, especially when we think about incredibly crippling diseases like Alzheimer's. And so, again, uh, you know, at the end, I think one of the challenges is the uniform benefit that we all receive, which tends to be extremely generous. And one of the proposals we have is that you might want to allow for more heterogeneity in the benefit structure. The fact that Medicare faces four challenges also means that it's unlikely that a single strategy can nail um, all four challenges going forward. So Craig and I uh, decided to write this chapter on economic principles. And we realized, because we don't agree on kind of what those, you know, how we should reform Medicare, we should kind of write down what those principles may be. Well, one principle that, that, that we think that all reforms should think about is who is the residual claimant. So in other words, just to put it bluntly, I'm going to wear my uh, business school professor hat on for one second. To put it bluntly, this essentially means someone should make money by when, when money is saved. Right. That's what it means to have to be the residual claimant. And in fee-for-service Medicare, you have no residual claimant. And so because we have no residual claimant, there tends to be a lot of overuse and fragmentation. The second principle is I think that, you know, with apologies to all the, the, the budget hawks in the room, I don't think our goal should really be to reduce or slow Medicare spending per se. That's a terrible goal. I think the goal should really be can we increase the insurance value of the program? So if the world gives us a great drug for Alzheimer's. I think the question we should ask ourselves is, is this drug valuable? And if it's valuable, how can we spend more on the Medicare program to get that drug to people who would benefit from it? I think the third goal is that it should remain a health insurance program. So if we think that elderly Medicare beneficiaries need housing, need food assistance, that's great. We should give them that assistance through other programs, maybe through more generous Social Security benefits, but not have Medicare cover things that aren't really health insurance. The fourth principle for reform is that I think we want to make sure that health care in 2030 is better than health care in 2020. And I think this often gets lost when we're talking about Medicare reform. Too often we think of the problem as being, how do we take a fixed set of treatments today and get them to everybody forever? But we want this set of treatments to actually be changing and improving over time. And that's a much harder challenge than taking 2019 healthcare and ensuring that people have access to 2019 healthcare in 2029 and 2039. Um, I think the one challenge that Medicare has is that uh, it, because of its size, it can engage in what economists would refer to as the classic holdup problem. I think the ACO program highlights this. So regardless of what you think about the ACO program, is it working, is it not working, 
One reason that it might not be working as well as we would have liked it to is because the ACO payment rates are implicitly tied to, explicitly tied to Medicare fee-for-service rates. So if I am running an ACO and I do a really, really good job of saving money in my ACO program, nothing prevents Medicare from coming along next year and whacking all the fee-for-service rates. Now, again, this would be, uh, this, this sort of would discourage a lot of innovation by ACOs. And so I think it's no surprise that you probably don't see rational firms making optimal investments in how to save money because everything is getting benchmarked to Medicare fee-for-service. And finally, I think there's this point about progressivity and richer beneficiaries should, I think, in my view, be uh, asked to pay more. They also have a higher willingness to pay. Uh, point number six takes us to premium support, and I think the Congressional Budget Office has already taken the lead in helping us think about how premium support can be deployed in Medicare. And then finally, I think the great opportunity with Medicare is uh, its spillovers onto other payers. These spillovers can be good, like in the 1980s when Medicare adopted the DRG program, so did uh, private payers. They can also be bad. Medicare pays for a lot of dubious technologies, and private payers are forced to pick up payment for those technologies because they don't want to be sued if they were to say uh, no to those technologies. So in terms of like a roadmap for reform, you know, let me just kind of go back one slide because you'll start to read my slides. I don't want you to read my slides. I just want you to kind of say, a lot is known about how to reform Medicare, a lot. And I think MedPAC in particular, and I think the think tanks also have done some great work, and we spent a lot of time reading those proposals, and we endorse them. So what I want to focus on is new ideas, right? And I think some of the new ideas are, let's talk about prescription drugs. It's, it's a small share of total spending, but it's, it's likely to be a larger share of spending. I think the first is to introduce pricing pressure on Part B drugs. And we should learn from the tremendous success of the PBMs negotiating prices in Medicare Part D. We should be thinking aggressively about letting the PBMs and letting the payers use their negotiating powers and formularies in Medicare Part B. So that would include like all the really expensive drugs that are given in doctor's offices, for example. The industry will definitely hate this proposal, but that doesn't mean it's a bad proposal. Um, the second is Medicare forces payers to cover, for example, every drug in the protected classes. And that reduces the ability of the program to negotiate. Right? If we tell manufacturers, I am forced to cover your drug, manufacturers will say, great, what will you do if, you, if I charge a higher price? And then I say, nothing, I'll actually continue to pay for it. The manufacturer is taught in business school to raise prices when they hear that. And so we constantly complain about high pharmaceutical prices, but we have revealed a close to infinite appetite to pay those prices. And so you know, I think in the absence of creating formularies, just as we did in Medicare Part D, we will continue to see extremely high prices in Medicare Part B. Um, I think there are some great opportunities to improve and increase the insurance value in Medicare Part D. And I think the largest opportunity ahead of us is to think about improving ex and expanding the Medicare Advantage program and thinking, thinking hard about using premium support as we rely more on the Medicare Advantage program. The Medicare Advantage program, however, in its current form is probably not worth doubling down on simply because we overpay in Medicare Advantage because we're extremely lax in how we think about risk adjustment in this program. So let me just highlight that with one slide. This is work that my colleagues um, at Harvard Medical School have done. And you can see, uh, just, just look at the two graphs over on the left. The first two bar charts show us the the, the fraction of Medicare beneficiaries coded with any chronic condition, and there's two dark blue graphs, and they're basically equally high. The first graph is, they're, they're for people who elected Medicare fee-for-service at the age of 65. So it sort of shows you how many of them had a chronic condition before they went into Medicare at age 65, and how many had a chronic condition just after they selected Medicare fee-for-service. And it goes up just a little bit, and it goes up just a little bit because there's no incentives to overcode in Medicare fee-for-service. However, now look at the next set in gray. Those are people who elected Medicare Advantage. Before they elect Medicare Advantage, only about 31, 32% of them have a chronic disease. One year later, something like 
38% have been diagnosed with having a chronic disease. So, you know, if we create an environment where firms can make a lot of money, not by delivering high-value healthcare, but essentially by upcoding, we should not be surprised that firms will invest a lot of resources in the upcoding business. We can do a much better job of risk adjustment. We can risk adjust a lot better than Medicare Advantage risk adjust, and in our proposal, we spend some time talking about how we might go about doing this. But then, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to come to this slide, which is if we can improve the risk adjustment in Medicare Advantage, which I believe is very much in our grasp, we should think about Medicare Advantage as being the chassis for Medicare reform. And the key idea would be we create competition between Medicare Advantage plans. They bid right now against a benchmark. And right now the way Medicare Advantage works is if I bid above the benchmark, the enrollees pay a premium that equals the difference between the benchmark and what I bid. And if I bid below the benchmark, I receive a, a, a payment which is equal to what I bid. That's all awesome. This is the part that works. The problem is, what is the benchmark? Well, the benchmark is Medicare fee-for-service. And I just spent eight minutes telling you about how Medicare fee-for-service is unlikely to be a good benchmark. It tends to be incredibly generous with a raft of medical technologies. And so it becomes incredibly hard then for Medicare Advantage companies to actually provide a plan where they have to cover everything that the benchmark fee-for-service Medicare plan has to cover. So I think we've got to think about Medicare Advantage along the lines of the exchanges in the Affordable Care Act, where you're not relying on sort of a public option benchmark per se. You're thinking about plan competition between plans on an exchange to come up with what you're willing to pay for them. And we should give these plans much more latitude in the medical technologies that they cover and in the, the, the sort of the extent to which they have narrow networks. So I'm gonna stop over there and, and, and take more questions um, during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. So the Social Security Disability Insurance Program provides benefits to people who are under 65 and who become unable to work because of a disability. This is a social insurance program. It is different from the Supplemental Security Income Program, which is the means-tested disability program. And what that means is that beneficiaries, SSDI beneficiaries, receive their full Social Security benefits not reduced for early claiming, and they receive Medicare coverage. Now, the main challenge with this program has always been how to balance protection against disability-related earnings losses against incentives for labor force non-participation. And this latter concern, the risk of creating incentives for, not, for labor force non-participation, is a really serious concern. If you look at the program rules themselves, they create work disincentives. For example, to apply, you can't be working, at least not above a substantial gainful activity level, which is currently equal to about $15,000 a year. Applicants have to wait months for a decision, sometimes years if they go on to appeal, all the while not working. And then once approved, their benefits are suspended if they earn above that SGA threshold. This is often referred to as a cash cliff. You heard this term earlier, and it's so named because for even a dollar above the SGA threshold, in principle, one's income sort of falls off a cliff, okay? That's a very strong work disincentive, and we often talk about it as an implicit tax rate, a very high implicit tax rate. Now, there are some work incentives that have been um, um, added to the program over time to try to counteract these disincentives. These include a trial work period, which allows people to experiment with work without losing their benefits, an extended period of eligibility, which allows people to restart their benefits if they stop working. It also includes the Ticket to Work program where beneficiaries have voluntary access to employment services and supports. There are other work incentives as well. The research evidence to date, however, suggests that these work incentives really haven't done much to increase employment and earnings among SSDI beneficiaries. 
Now, SSDI was once growing very fast, and it was on the brink of insolvency. Since then, however, and really since about 2011, it began contracting. And now, solvency really is a secondary concern. And to see the latter point, um, here, here's a, a picture of caseload growth, that is the number of SSDI disabled worker beneficia beneficiaries from 1960 through 2017. You can see that in almost every year, except the early 1980s when we had the 1980 amendments, the caseload has increased until about 2011 when it began declining. Now there are important reasons for this decline. It has to do with demographics. It also has to do with demographic changes made in the way appeals, uh, appeals are handled um, in the judiciary. Um, but you know, this is about 5.8% of the labor force, equivalent to about 5.8% of the labor force now. So if the narrative, and I do think the narrative about the SSDI program really has changed with this new contraction in the caseload, if then the narrative really isn't about a runaway program that's expanding expenditures, what is the case for reforming this program? Well, we can turn to the research evidence and we learn five or six key points. First of all, SSDI participation is driven not only by health problems, but also by weak, weak employment prospects. What does this suggest? It suggests that a principle to guide reform should be to try and improve employment prospects. Second, many SSDI beneficiaries have partial work capacity. What does that imply we should do? It suggests we should measure work capacity better, and then we should help people identify and transfer their work capacity to occupations that might be better matches with their remaining abilities. Three, we've learned that work capacity decays the longer people are out of work. And as I've told you, people spend a long time pursuing SSDI benefits out of work. What does this suggest we should do? It suggests we should try and intervene early, and importantly, we should allow applicants to stay in the labor force whenever possible, allow them to maintain their employment networks, their very specific employer accommodations, um, and um, their labor force attachment, if at all possible. Not to require it, but to allow it. Fourth, we should um, we've learned that the existing work incentives have been ineffective. They don't work. What should we do? Well, perhaps they've been ineffective simply because by the time we deliver the incentives to people, they've already spent years proving to us that they can't work by not working, right? Five, we have learned that the social benefits of the SSDI program are substantial. What does this mean? This means that the optimal SSDI program is not no SSDI program. So we need to retain the protective insurance aspect of the program while reducing its distortionary costs on employment. Lastly, this program is outdated, and this suggests we need to update and re-optimize the core functions of the program. To give you an example of this, the way in which disability determinations is done is based primarily on heuristics. So, for most applicants, that is applicants who don't have severe disabilities that qualify them for the listings, the disability decision hinges upon medical vocational guidelines. These are also called the grid. Now here's an example from the grid. For an applicant whose residual functional capacity is that they have the physical strength for light work, now that's more strength than sedentary capacity, but less strength than moderate or heavy capacity, and these are the actual words used in the grid, then if they, so they have light work capacity, they have less than a high school degree, and their previous work experience has been in skilled or semi-skilled work, but those skills are not readily transferable to other occupations, then the entire disability decision hinges upon age. So if they're in their early 50s, they're not disabled, but if they're 55 or older, they are disabled. So I think the problems here are, are obvious. For one, this, these categories are very coarse. It ignores the individual variation in actual work capacity. They're incomplete. Why are we focusing exclusively on physical strength without providing any guidance for mental or sensory disabilities, which we know have been an important 
uh, mental disabilities in particular, important drivers of caseload growth. And they're also outdated. These categories are defined based on the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, which was phased out in the 1990s. They haven't been updated since. So what I propose is that we eliminate the grid and we figure out how to measure work capacity in a better way. What would a better system be? Well, it would be individualized for one. We would do individualized measurement of work capacity. We'd measure the full range of work abilities, not just physical abilities, but also cognitive abilities, psychomotor abilities, psychosocial abilities. We would also base, um, we would um, also base our measures on validated scientific methods. So how would this work? Well, first, we'd measure functional capacity in all domains, as I've said. Then we'd match individuals' abilities to occupational requirements. That is, compare those abilities to the requirements of all occupations in the national economy. We would get a list of occupations that an individual has the functional abilities to perform, and then we could prune the list to make sure it matches with their skills and educational background, okay? Then we, with this list in hand, we could simply apply our current standard, which says, asks, really, can the applicant do any substantial work in the national economy? If we had detailed information of this sort, we could use it also to target early, early interventions that would allow us to rehabilitate functional abilities or even retrain people so that they can access occupations for which they have the functional abilities, but they might be missing some skills. Here's an example from our research just to um, show how a system like this might work. So what we did is we surveyed a nationally representative sample of Americans about their functional abilities. There were 52 abilities, and these were the same abilities that the ONET system, this is the um, Department of Labor's Occupational Information Network system, uses to rate the functional ability requirements of jobs. So we took the same scales and rated our, asked our individuals to rate themselves on these same ability scales. So what we had was then an apples to apples comparison of individuals' abilities measured on the same scales as jobs are rated by their occupational requirements. Well, what did we learn? Well, for each person, we could calculate then what occupations they could do. Didn't matter if they were currently working or not. We can still compute their potential occupations. And then we could weight that by the number of jobs available in those occupations. And what you see here is that among people in our data who were not receiving SSDI benefits, the average person had access to 41% of jobs available for their education level. Among the SSDI recipients in our data, they had access to 25% of jobs available for their education level. And by access, I don't mean that they necessarily could go out and get the job today, just that they had the physical, functional abilities and cognitive abilities to perform 25% of jobs for, these, um, for that education level, their own education level. If we say, well, let's adopt a, a, a more relaxed standard where we say, we're gonna credit you with the ability to perform an occupation if you can do at least 90% of the abilities required for that occupation. And here we see that our SSDI recipients have the abilities to do 90% of about 48% of jobs in the national economy. Now, what this shows is that it would be possible to implement a system of this kind where we did more detailed measurement of functional capacities and compare it to requirements of actual jobs that exist today in the US economy. This system is actually similar to a system that's already being used or has been used for a long time in the Netherlands. All right, so my second proposed reform is to allow partial disability benefits. So people would receive disability benefits at the same time as they were also earning, presumably in part-time work. A disability rating would equal one minus the ratio of an individual's residual earnings capacity to their pre-disability earnings times 100%. So how does this work? Well, if an applicant had, say, pre-disability earnings of $50,000, their residual earnings capacity was now rated to be about $30,000, then their um, 
their disability benefit would be 40% of a full benefit. Okay, they have 40%, they are 40% disabled, they have 40% of a full benefit. Now, and this is important, anyone with residual earnings capacity below the SGA level would receive full benefits, just as they do now. That's the current rule, right? We would also estimate residual earnings capacity from the average earnings on the highest paying potential occupation. This would rely on the work capacity measurement system where we were able to actually identify the set of potential occupations. It wouldn't have to be the highest paying occupation. It could be the second highest paying occupation. That's what the Dutch do. Um, it, could, it could be something else. But the point is, it would be feasible to determine what those residual earnings capacity are. There are several advantages to this reform. I think the main one is that individuals could continue working while applying. We could get rid of the work continuing disability reviews because now work is allowed. This would enable people to retain their very specific employer accommodations if they have them, help, help keep their skills up, and also keep them in the labor force if possible. There are some disadvantages. One, we would get more applications and, and possibly induced entry from people who currently work but now would be better off because they combine SSDI receipt with earnings. This would, however, be offset by some of the new people flowing into the system who, under this new system for partial benefits, would actually receive partial benefits instead of full benefits. On balance, we don't quite know where, where we'd come out, although some research has suggested that actually we would save money. Even if we didn't save money, the fact that expenditures for the SSDI program are now coming down suggests we might have some room for some reoptimization. So in conclusion, I want to emphasize that my proposals are not about requiring SSDI beneficiaries to work. Okay, that's really important here. The intention is simply to allow people who do retain some work capacity to work while they can also bring complementary SSDI support to the table. I would grandfather in current beneficiaries, and we would need to guarantee a timely reassessment that would enable people to get their benefits increased if their health worsened. This is not the case now. It takes a while to get a disability reassessment if you want one, and most people don't want one. Partial benefits would be a major reform, but in order to do it, it really does rely on SSDI being able to measure work capacity in a more robust and articulated way. So you really can't do one without taking a very hard look at how we actually measure work capacity. Could we identify partial capacity? I think we could, but we'd have to work on that too. We couldn't just do partial benefits alone. And lastly, I'll close by saying that um, these reforms pair very well with many of the other SSDI reforms that have been proposed by many others. They work well with early interventions to retrain or repair work capacity. I think those would be great in combination with these. They would also work very well with a generalized benefit offset. A benefit offset gives people post-entitlement incentives to further increase work effort when opportunities arise without jeopardizing their disability rating. I like the generalized benefit offset better than a regular benefit offset because it actually features, um, instead of a pure tax on employment, some um, 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 incentives and, and earning subsidies that would actually properly incentivize work. So with that, I'll close. Thank you. You guys go there, right? Okay, good. All right, so this has just been terrific, and I particularly, that was wonderful, by the way, Nicole. I, and uh, it's a program that I have been struggling with for a long time, and you helped me a lot, so thank you. Um, uh, we're now going to get some reflections from Karen and Angela, uh, who were given the opportunity to read, uh, along with myself, Angela is my co-author, um, the entire volume, and then uh, um, make an effort at reflecting on what it all meant and trying to put it all together. And that was a big challenge, but um, it was something we enjoyed doing. I'm going to introduce Karen and then Angela and let Karen and Angela go one after the other. And then we'll have some question and dialogue between the panelists, the rest of the panelists. And as you listen to Karen and Angela, you might 
occur things you want to say to respond to their reflections. So Karen Dynan is a professor of the practice of economics at Harvard University and a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, formerly an assistant secretary of the Treasury and co-director of economic studies at Brookings. Karen's work is focused on macroeconomic policy, consumer behavior, and housing policy. Angela Rashidi is a research fellow here in poverty studies at AEI. Angela has years of experience in researching and implementing those programs, including eight years as Deputy Commissioner of New York City's Department of Social Services. Angela studies the safety net, particularly in relation to its impact on low-income Americans. Karen, you're up. Do you need this? Yeah, I One slide. And I want to congratulate um, the AAPSS and the editors on producing this important volume. Uh, regardless of whether you agree with every recommendation in the volume, I think the synthesis of this uh, rigorous evidence around the successes and the shortcomings of these programs is just really important for both teaching purposes and for policymaking purposes. Um, when the editors approached me about joining the project, I, I kind of wondered why they needed a macroeconomist in this cast of all-star microeconomist uh, authors that they put together. But as I, I thought about it more, I, I saw their brilliance uh, in that um, I think as we approach reform, it doesn't really make sense to do it without thinking about what's going on in terms of the broader context. So that's what I cover in my piece. In this single slide, um, I just lay out several key uh, kind of considerations in terms of the broader um, context that we should be thinking about. In the upper left, what you can see is the fact that federal debt, as, as we all know, is on uh, track to reach unsustainable uh, levels in coming decades. Um, I, um, there are um, some prominent macroeconomists who have uh, raised the point of late that lower interest rates uh, give us a little more space uh, to be selective in how we go about tackling this problem, but I don't know anyone who doesn't think that we uh, don't need to tackle it. Uh, in the upper right, um, you can see uh, what I read as evidence that we're facing slower macroeconomic growth. Most macroeconomists think that the new normal for overall economic growth in this country is around 2%. That's what we've seen in recent decades, uh, down considerably from the 3% or more that we saw in the latter part of the last century. Um, so that's a, we think that slowing reflects uh, demographic forces rather than um, policy missteps. But regardless, we should want uh, faster macroeconomic growth, both uh, for the standard of living and because it will make it easier to address our fiscal challenges. Um, the lower left panel um, speaks to uh, the, the fact that we're going to have limited ability to uh, fight future uh, recessions. Uh, interest rates have fallen four to five percentage points since the early 1990s. Uh, and this is really at the heart of the zero lower bound constraints that are facing the Federal Reserve. Uh, monetary policy has played an important role stabilizing the economy in the face of the last few recessions. And it's just not going to be able to play as large a role in coming recessions. Uh, and then the lower right panel uh, is just a kind of way of depicting the rising in income inequality that we've seen in this country. And um, you know, when it, when it comes to thinking about this uh, rising income inequality uh, and, and what it implies about the redistribution about, that these programs are doing, I think there are complicated issues that have to do with economics and fairness considerations that determine where one stands. But I think regardless of where one comes out on those things, I think we should all be concerned that this growing income inequality and the decline in mobility that has accompanied it uh, is uh, causing um, kind of damage to our social fabric and also hurting our political process. Okay, so that's the economic context. So I take 
these observations and combine them with what I'm reading in the papers in this volume to draw um, you know, several specific implications uh, that we should be thinking about as we reform these programs. So I'm just going to list them. The first is that it is absolutely necessary to fix the finances of our social security program, and that that fix should be a progressive one. I think Gary laid out the case for why it's absolutely necessary to fix the finances. It is a central part of our fiscal challenges over the longer term. Um, I think it makes sense to do the fix progressively, um, both because incomes at the top are higher, but also if you um, read the, the data around um, uh, kind of what's going on lower in the distribution between the decline in defined benefit pensions and the fact that Americans in parts of the distribution really seem to have struggled to save, which I think may be in part reflecting the limited income growth. Um, they, they look, there are many Americans that look alarmingly unprepared for retirement. The second uh, implication is that I think it's imperative that we curb growth in spending on health care. Given our fiscal challenges, uh, it is uh, essential that we, do, that we do curb this spending because I think if we don't, it threatens to crowd out socially valuable spending, both at the federal level, but also at the state and local level. The central tension, of course, is that Americans, uh, they want more and better health care. Uh, so this points to the fact that it is going to be necessary to contain what's called ex excess cost growth. Um, it's, this is not an easy problem at all, and this is something that's covered well in Amitrab and uh, Craig's paper, but I think you guys put forward a set of, of really constructive uh, uh, reform ideas for making progress on that front. Um, the third overarching uh, implication that I draw from the papers in this volume is not to, co not to cut spending on, on poor children or on their parents. And one running theme in the papers in these conference is that they document uh, this really important literature that has emerged over the last 10, 15 years that demonstrates that some spending in these programs, it's not just about alleviating hardship in the moment. Uh, it is also uh, producing important longer-term outcomes that are, that, are, that are good. So in particular, it's some of these programs are increasing adult labor supply. They are um, increasing adult incomes. They are reducing engagement with the criminal justice system uh, when these children are adults. And uh, you know, under that view, so, so I think these things are important not only for the individuals involved, um, but also for the broader economy. So under that view, uh, these things are, are really investments in those two things. Uh, the fourth implication I draw is that the reforms that we make need to be highly attentive to the potential disincentive effects of these programs on labor supply and saving. Um, it's good to follow uh, Nicole on this point. I think she, her paper, along with a, a number of the other papers, talks seriously about the disincentive effects of these programs. And I also appreciate the fact that your paper and uh, many of the other papers lay out some very specific uh, reform ideas in terms of curbing these disincentives. Um, but I just think that uh, doing so is just important for both individual outcomes, but again, for broader growth in the economy. Um, the last implication that I'll talk about is that I, I believe that any conversation around reform needs to be thinking about um, the macro stabilization effects of these uh, programs. So as Robert mentioned in his remarks, um, these programs, uh, they do provide important support to individuals when the economy goes into a downturn. But the other important point to recognize is that these programs are directing uh, support towards people with high propensities to consume, so can play a valuable role uh, helping to stabilize the economy in a world where some of our traditional stabilization tools like monetary policy are going to be more limited. So I think uh, you know there's some mention of this in the, the Schanzenbach paper and in the Von Wachter paper, certainly, and, and I appreciate their proposals for strengthening 
those dimensions of the programs, but it would be great to see discussion about how we can uh, basically apply those same principles to all of the programs that are discussed in the book. So with that, um, I think I've talked enough, and I'm going to turn things over to Angela. Great, great. Thank you. Um, so I think when, when Jim and Robert Moffat originally asked Robert Dorr um, to write a reflection for this volume, and then Robert uh, invited me to be a co-author with him, I think they were really looking for a reflection that offered a different perspective. And I think that that's what we were able to accomplish in our, in our reflection. And also really one that was focused on mean, the means-tested programs, because that's really the background that Robert and I um, come from. I'm going to be very brief in my uh, comments, just because I know we're running out of time and we do want to open it up um, to questions. But there, I just want to highlight kind of three, po three major points from our reflection and then encourage um, all of you to go, uh, go to the volume and read through it. We, when we were looking at the um, volume as a whole and thinking about our reflection, we wanted to really look at this question of adequacy. So were these means-tested programs, how do we assess their adequacy? And I think it's really hard, hard um, not to conclude that these programs are not adequate after you, t after you uh, look at the volume as a whole in terms of means-tested programs. And the reason is that um, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of literature that they show these programs are pretty effective in terms of reducing material hardship, and they have positive benefits, for, um, particularly for children. And they also re reach the vast majority of low-income families, at least a portion of the safety net. So from that perspective, um, uh, in our reflection, we, we concluded that it's uh, 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 fairly obvious that these programs do reduce uh, material hardship which is one of the main goals of those programs. So the second point is even though they are good at reducing material hardship, it's also pretty clear that they fail if you think of the safety net as a collection of programs all designed to help families uh, escape poverty, that they largely fail. And the, the reason they largely fail is because they have all of these dynamics that sometimes are in conflict with each other. So you have a program like the Earned Income Tax Credit and child care uh, assistance that are really uh, supporting people in work. And then, as you'll see in some of the other chapters, like on SNAP and housing, it's actually uh, disincentivizing people uh, from working. So there's really kind of this, this conflict that's going on. Um, and so we, in, the, in our reflection, really talk about how if you're going to really help families escape poverty, there's a need to address the underlying causes of poverty, which in our perspective is largely employment and all of the factors that play into um, whether people work or not. Um, and so then we kind of, with that context that yes, the safety net's good at reducing material hardship, but shouldn't it probably be doing more in terms of uh, addressing the underlying causes, we then offered up uh, our own uh, reform framework. Um, first, we agreed with a number of proposals that um, have been discussed today, particularly around disability assistance. But then we make the argument that um, incremental reforms um, may have marginal effects, but there really is a need to kind of revisit the safety net as a whole and think about what is it intended to uh, accomplish and do we need to reprior not only reprioritize in terms of where can we get the biggest bang for our buck, like maybe it's investment in children, for example, instead of on job training programs that have been found to be pretty ineffective, so reprioritizing, but also taking a look at it from the, the foundational perspective of employment. What can these programs do collectively to support people in employment so that they can then escape poverty uh, uh, on their own? Um, so with that, I'll, I'll kind of leave it there, and I, I hope we do have kind of a, an opportunity to, to respond to some questions and have a conversation about this idea of more fundamental reforms versus just tweaking on the, on the margins. So my job is to moderate, uh, and this is, a, this is a tough one because it's a great panel, and we also have Gary over there. I, I sort of wanted to ask you a question, but I'm going to have to <coughs> focus on the panelists for, first. And I, have, I want to ask a global question to Robert, and, uh, and it's related to Jim's very first slide. And that was that you depicted the enormous growth in spending on all of these programs if you look at them all together. Um, but the fact is it, that the big growth is in health care, uh, Medicaid and Medicare, and Social Security. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, just globally, looking at where savings could be achieved versus where we really shouldn't look for savings, uh, whether a way to look at it is focus on where the money is 
and not so much on where the money isn't. Mm. And the second structural question, which we didn't really discuss much, is that some of these programs are federal programs. They're run entirely by the federal government. And then others are part of this federal state partnership that you and I are familiar with and Angela and I are familiar with. Um, and I wondered whether in looking at all of this you had a conclusion or in, in your other studies about which works best. Let the federal government take care of it all by themselves or let the federal state partnership proceed as we currently have? Well, uh, uh, I, I think you're correct uh, that uh, by far those three programs you mentioned are dominating the, the both the level and the faster growth, you know, and Karen referred to that in her remarks uh, that we have to control welfare, uh, well, health spending is what Karen referred to. Uh, and I think everybody agrees with that goal and that's where the money is, but how to do it is the hard part. I mean, I think you listen to Amitab and you say, this is an incredibly complicated program, Medicare. Uh, we, we have to redesign it in a very fundamental way to, provide, to decrease the wasteful spending and also deliver you know, other things that aren't being delivered at lower cost. And uh, where that comes out in the end is, you know, unsure, but you got to have, it's not just a large expenditure, it's just that it's so inefficiently being spent. That's what I, that's what I get out of Amitabh so strongly. Uh, and, um, you know, and I think on Gary's side, I, you know, I mean, look, Gary, speak to that. I, 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 you know, I have to just say, we conclude every one of these programs has its own problems. And Social Security has a legacy debt problem, which is like 50 years old, and that has never really been solved. And we're living with past mistakes. And how do we, and to me, and you know, Gary often says, this is a political problem. We know how to, you know, there are ways to solve this. <laughs> you know? And general tax revenues or other kinds of ways you could, could solve the problem that we've inherited. Well, just, uh, just, just on, on the Social Security, because this, I, Karen, maybe you can address this. You said that we need a progressive solution, I think is what you said. Mm -hmm. So cut future benefits for higher earners now. So the current recipients are not touched. Higher earners, like all of us, mm -hmm. change the formula. Social Security benefits later are less generous to us smaller portion of our income will come from Social Security. You showed that. Why not do that? Isn't that a progressive solution? You mean as opposed to um, raising, raising taxes? Raising taxes. Lifting the cap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, so, so um, that would be one possibility. I mean, this is, this is along the lines of, you know, it's not hard to, I mean, it's not the the things we the levers we have are not that hard to understand, but uh, we have to make hard choices. Um, I would say uh, that Social Security is a extremely popular program with people really in much of the income distribution. I suspect that trying to cut benefits for higher income people would be politically unpopular, but you know it is an option. Um, okay, so now, um, Amitab, you didn't mention, did you make an argument for or against Medicare for All? And, what, and how would you react to that? So really, I guess our point is you really have to articulate what the Medicare for All program looks like. We were not making an argument against a Medicare advantage with premium support for all. That would be called Medicare for All. That makes tons of sense to me as an economist. But if someone said, well, gee, let's take the current Medicare program and let's expand that to people who are 50 and over or all the way down, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, right? Because we've not done the hard work of turning the faucet off on paying for the dubious medical technologies. And until we do that, I don't think it makes sense to really expand it. Because every time we pay for something dubious, not only do we get, have to pay for something dubious, we send a signal to manufacturers saying, please make something dubious because we have high willingness to pay for it. Um, you also made a point that I thought that goes throughout the whole volume 
in that in the, it makes Medicare and Medicaid to some extent different mm -hmm. than the other programs. And that is that it is a beneficiary of very powerful interests. Yeah. And I, I wondered if anybody else would expand on that. I mean, it, I've always sort of felt that that, yeah. that that in the in the in the competition for funds, yeah. the healthcare world has an advantage over all the rest of us who run any poverty programs. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I certainly do. I mean, my own sense is actually Medicaid. My own sense of this is that Medicaid and state legislators have done a met much better job of not getting into bed with the lobbyists relative to Congress. You should come to New York. <laughs> <laughs> no, so this is not to say Medicaid is perfect, yeah. but I think there is a discipline that comes from <clears throat> the balanced budget agreements that the states have to grapple with every day that makes it a far more judicious payer than the federal government has been. So with the federal government, there's always a lobby saying, pay me what I paid plus 6%. So we pay for all the oncology treatments, you know, ASP plus 6%. There's no formula in the history of economics that says you should pay something plus a 6% tip, right? Yeah. But we managed to pay for all the oncology drugs that way, right? So again, I think the more we can get Congress out of Medicare, and that's why I want private markets, because I think you know, if we could market competition in Medicare, that's one way of keeping Congress out of it. And Nicole, the, the best chart of the day was the SSDI curve uh, coming down and, and your recognition that good economic times have a role or play a role in the extent to which people apply for and receive disability benefits, which is a little, you know, more wages, more jobs, they're less likely to go get yeah. disability benefits. And then you make an argument on how to get, isn't that the best evidence of all that the recipients and applicants want to and can work? That's what I wanted to ask. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, it, it, you know, if, if the other thing that's happened in the backdrop here is that we have seen an unprecedented increase in employment by people with disabilities since about 2011. Um, that has never, that we've just never seen before. It's really a historic turnaround in what really has been a downward trend in employment by people with disabilities. And, you know, we don't know exactly why. Certainly some of it is going to be this, the strong economy. Employers um, are desperate. and they're Yes, just, and maybe willing now in. to think, think hard about how can we make accommodations and Wages try to retain high. our workers. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, kind of the, the, I think kind of the harder aspect of it is that there have been um, internal reforms um, in the way in which the disability judges adjudicate cases. And what you see, you know, you can't, we, we're still working on the research that's gonna really try to say how much of the decline is, is due to this. But the picture I didn't show you is how awards have really, really fallen. Both award rates and mm. the number of awards has really just, just, it's a really sharp decline. So this combination of both, um, you know, a reduction really in kind of the generosity of the program and a favorable labor market has kind of in some ways, I, I think, probably created conditions for people to seek work and fortunately many of them are finding them. Hmm. And then uh, just sort of generally for the whole panel or for anyone, do, do, we, do we all agree that, the, uh, and if we don't, where is the biggest weakness on the adequacy question? I mean, I think the, the volume starts out by saying one conclusion we reach is that it's big and it is effective in many ways. And do we, do we agree with that basically? And then there's the question is where is it weakest? And I just, any one of you, or, or is it children? Is it seniors? Is it disability? Well, I'll just jump in really quickly. I think it is children. I think we, I think the pot is adequate, but I don't think the the different groups that we're spending on is necessarily um, adequate, and we need to reprioritize. And I would personally reprioritize towards children. Other? So I'd say the single biggest problem with the Medicare program is that it doesn't include long-term care, right? And that puts extraordinary strain on families and children. Uh, and we don't really have a coherent policy to think about how to add a long-term care benefit to Medicare. Maybe the right way to do it is to boost Social Security benefits. I don't know the, that answer, but I think if we're thinking about program interactions and inadequacy, long-term care is definitely one place where Medicare is inadequate. 
Robert? I, I would say a, a group that is not being served well, and I'm not sure I'd use the word adequacy, are very, very unskilled men yeah. uh, who simply have such low skills and their job opportunities are so bad, <laughs> they're not going anywhere. And uh, our programs aren't like addressing their problems. We don't understand mm -hmm. their problems. And the things we're doing with education, job training, aren't working for them. And to get them on that trajectory is, is something I have not seen a solution for. And it seems to me to be a really important problem. And just to come back to you, Nicole, that one, it does relate to your program. Isn't that it, right? That's right. And, 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 and actually, I was going to even point to the Mary Daly, Mark Duggan argument that the SSI benefits, so the means-tested part of the disability programs here, you know, don't even get people to the poverty line, mm -hmm. right? I mean, SSDI benefits, on the one hand, are sort of equivalent to a minimum wage job plus health insurance, which, which, sounds, which sounds good. Um, but it's still not a lot of money, and a lot of those people really have missed out on income growth over the last several decades. But I was also saying men are, men have, some men have dropped out of the labor force mm. because of the availability of disability, and the disability programs don't do very much to help them, to help them get back in. return to work. That's right. Aaron? I, I, well, I just want to say I, I agree that, I mean, the, 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 the question about adequacy I think in many ways, I mean, there's a lot of good news in this volume that there, uh, there are many successes of these programs. I think Gary's remarks about Social Security are among the most powerful ones in there. Um, but I do, I, I think that the problem is on the kind of economic mobility front. I mean, that's uh, just a, a big problem in our country that people, uh, you know, are at the bottom and they have a hard time climbing Getting up. up. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think that's that's where yeah. these uh, this these... this labor force participation question and the disincentive effects are so important. Okay, we have time for some questions from the audience, and I'll open it up. It's been a long long session, but still, <laughs> stay with it. Yes. Oh, wait for the wait for the mic. Thanks. Michelle Stein, I'm with Inside Health Policy. And, and I have a question for you. You were saying with that you don't think things like food and housing, et cetera, should be yeah, part of Medicare. However, you were also saying to build off Medicare Advantage. And Medicare Advantage has been increasingly adding what you'd call social determinants of health, some of these other areas, into that program. So would you think that needs to be pulled back before adding or building off of MA? No, How thank, would you deal with that? thank you for that clarifying question. Um, our strong view is that if a private company sees it valuable, sees a valuable investment by giving its beneficiary or its enrollees food or housing to keep them out of the emergency room, that's great. That, we want that kind of innovation. We don't want to force the program to become a transfer program where you're trying to move resources to people and calling it health insurance. So if a Medicare Advantage plan says, look, I figured out the 16 asthmatics that I need to give an air conditioner to so that they don't go to the emergency room, that's great. We just don't want it to be part of the Medicare fee-for-service benefit, right? Because then a whole bunch of things get covered with a very, in, in a very inefficient way. Because not everybody who, not everybody needs an air conditioner at home, not everybody needs housing, not everybody needs meal delivery. Another question? Yes, take one more. Hey, uh, Will Vanderveen with Deloitte. Um, my question is for Nicole and Karen to you as well. Um, I was, Nicole's fascinated that you brought up the um, Dutch version mm -hmm. of disability insurance because the Netherlands has a 70, about a 71% labor force participation rate. Um, ours is hovering around 63%, considerably lower than what it has been historically. Um, I'm wondering if you think there is what the scope would be to like, the kind of taking the Dutch version, would that be able to move the needle closer to where we've been around like 66% historically? It's a, it's a little hard to say, and I would say that the, the research evidence on the effectiveness of the various Dutch reforms is, um, you know, it's still somewhat kind of incomplete. It's, it's been, I think, a little bit difficult to get a handle on how, you know, how, how well have they worked. 
But that said, I do think that, and I have proposed that we should adopt their way or some variant of their way of measuring work capacity. The other thing the Dutch do that I'm a little more circumspect about is, um, is adding employer responsibility requirements. So you've often heard proposals for experience rating where, like workers' compensation systems, employers that have a lot more of their employees go into the SSDI program would pay either a higher tax to compensate for that, or they'd become responsible for some portion of the disability benefit payments. And that's where I, and I, I do write about this in, in, in the piece, that I do worry that those sorts of measures cause hiring disincentives. So employers would start avoiding trying to hire people with disabilities or who might become sick. Hmm. And, and that's sort of counter, counterproductive here, right? OK, all right, one more. There's one more, and then we'll, we'll finish. Uh, during the uh, Clinton administration, there was quite a bit of legislation and programs to reduce uh, welfare spending. And I noticed those were reflected in all of the charts from 1955 to 1999. The spending was kind of flat. But all of a sudden, in 99, it started to go up again. So I was just wondering what made it happen. What, what did that? Do you know? Robert, you want to you answer that one, Robert? <laughs> uh, it, a number of things happened in the late 1990s uh, in a number of programs. Number one, uh, the earned income tax credit was greatly liberalized and uh, increased the uh, dramatic spending uh, on working uh, poor families. That was one. Uh, secondly, the Social Security uh, SSI program for children was liberalized. and uh, uh, there was a kind of a sharp increase in uh, spending uh, on uh, disabled children. And please read the chapter on SSI, about SSI children, for how to address that issue. And number three was Medicaid. This you know, mm -hmm. dominates everything, and Medicaid spending has accelerated. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it comes back there, there. If you were looking at the dollars, you want to focus on a few programs here. Uh, if that's what your worry was, you know, yeah. uh, and figure out how to restructure them to say to deliver either the same you know services at lower costs, you know, or, or just uh, solidify them. And uh, so, but that's what the the answer statistically. Those three programs were the result of, was the cause of the, the major in sudden jump up. Uh, the increased interesting thing is that that increase in the late nineties. That jump up in total spending was actually greater than the so-called famous war on poverty in the 1960s when there was also a jump up. It was much bigger, and, and believe it or not, the welfare explosion was really much larger than, than uh, President Johnson's. <laughs> which is ironic because it was in the wake of efforts to reform one program, and which did remain flat and re in real terms is actually down, the, temp the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program. But while they did that, they also increased spending on working um, Americans with low incomes. And so healthcare and that increase, way more made up for any savings associated with the change in the one program, uh, and I think led to declines in child poverty at the same time, which yeah. is kind of ironic. So with that, we'll finish. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are you staying around for a few minutes? Sorry? Are you staying around for a few minutes? Yeah. Okay, I want to catch you. Roof's not going off.